Okay, time for the next talk. Here we have two of the architects of ES Plant, the project that we assembled this morning. So first up we have John Spencer and Angus Grattan. Hello, am I on? Yes. Righto, so as John said, I'm another John. Um, and this is my fault, and I'm sorry or happy, one of those two. So as I've set up here on my slide, this is the environmental sensor plant, which is what Andy and I came up with as a name at some stupid time in the morning, or how one person managed to recruit a friendly team to complete a project he's flailed at for years. Um, I'll just quickly go through what's on, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to run through the team who's been working on this. I'll do a bit of backstory, a short summary of what the ESP8266 actually is. Um, I'll talk a bit about KiCad, how we did the build, um, and then Gus will talk about some power and STM design stuff. So next, the team, 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 the A-team. Um, we've got Angus, Andy, John, Mark, Bob, Tom, Carrie, Adric, Hugh, and myself. Yay! Thank, thanks for all your help, guys. You've <laughs> right, I'm probably going to go too quick through these. Let's see how we go. So, this is actually my first Arduino project that I never completed. Um, in 2011, we were living in a, a flat in St Kilda, and we didn't have a water source to, to water our plants, and I thought, well, we've killed a lot, probably should come up with something to do it. As you can see from the photo on the side, that's as far as I got. It was a, an Ether 10 from John, running a MOSFET a pump, and I had a couple of little fun, funky things like that servo in the top corner there, which actually turns on, a, it's a tap effectively. That never worked. Uh, I, I put it in a box, but that was as far as we sort of got. Um, so, managing to recruit some friends, we, we, um, we all meet up at the Hackerspace in Melbourne, uh, where we, we came up with this sort of plan, and just sort of, we all did a few pitches to see what we could do as an idea. And um, this one has been, for some reason, popping up in my mind, so I thought, well, let's see if we can do something cool with the, the cheap Wi-Fi chips. Speaking of cheap Wi-Fi chips, this is the cheap Wi-Fi chip. It's the ESP8266. It's made in China. Um, Gus will talk about it at some point, probably not today. <laughs> Friday? If, come to so, Friday? Yeah, come to Gus's talk on Friday. Uh, it's a 32-bit, 80 megahertz chip. Uh, it includes Wi-Fi, and that's pretty much it. A couple of uh, GPIO pins. Not a lot in the way of um, analog to digital pins. But you can program it with the Arduino interface, which makes it fairly easy to get into. Uh, it has a low power mode, which is important for something like this project, because this project runs on solar panel. Uh, we've had some pretty good results. Are you going to talk about results? Yep, cool. Gus has graphs. Um, we designed this using KiCad, and I got fancy with animations. KiCad has sort of two steps. You design your schematic, and then you design your PCB. Um, the, this has been an interesting one, and I'll talk about that next. Uh, if you haven't tried KiCad, it's worth getting into. There's some pretty good tutorials online, and they've just released their first stable release for like two years. So it, it's improved a fair bit lately. Um, one of the interesting things we did with this project was we did a bake-off. So Angus and I worked on the schematics, mostly Angus worked on the schematics, and we completed that. Why, that should be doing something. We designed two different boards, um, PCB boards, using the same schematic. So those two boards are functionally equivalent. They have the same pins. They have the same components, um, but different design philosophies. Now, ultimately, people who have the kit will realize that they've got the larger one of the two. There's a few reasons for that, the main one being that it's much easier to make. Uh, it required a little bit of it, less work to make it work. but. Um, yeah, the, uh, the smaller one was, was just, it's a, it's a bastard to solder. Um, right. And this is our pit of despair. <laughs> um, we did most of the build, as John said, in his, in his office with the, 
the um, pick and place machine running around. Uh, yes. And a bit of gold plating. I just thought I'd cover some of the things that you wouldn't normally get on a plant sensor. Um, an accelerometer. Now, as Gus said, there's only one gag for that, and that's because I want it to say, if it falls over, help, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, PIRs, uh, LED lights as well. Um, actually, I've run just the LED lights for about five hours off the battery, so that's actually not too bad. And the batteries that probably won't catch fire, which is a good thing, but it does add to the, sort of the cost you get. Um, if it was being made in China, you might not get that as a feature. Um, these things were mostly added because they're interesting to play with. If you're looking at it, it's very easy to get a result out of it. And now I'm going to pass over to Gus, which is going to involve a bit of a screw around with the things. So talk amongst yourself for a few seconds. Hi everyone, uh, I just wanted to talk quickly about a couple of the aspects of the ES plant that I think are interesting from a technical perspective. Uh, maybe the people who have ES plants might think they're interesting or they might think they're unnecessarily complicated, but either way, I'm just going to go over them. I didn't really envisage that quite this many additional people who haven't seen ES plant before would turn up, um, so hopefully this will still make sense to you, but we're going to go over a few of the features of the um, open source solar powered, battery powered garden monitoring board. Has. The first one, as everybody probably noticed who built it, is there's a second microcontroller on board as well as the STM32. Uh, we wanted to have a USB to serial interface and we wanted to have an ADC. So rather than sort of shopping around for two chips, I thought, why don't we get one of these sort of very, very cheap ARM Cortex M0 microcontrollers and use that? And it's got a whole lot of features, as you can see. Uh, they're really, really cheap, even in fairly small quantities. Um, we're only using a really small subset of the features. Um, we're using the fact that it can do USB without an external crystal ray, um, oscillator, which just saves a bit of cost and a bit of board space. We're using the fact that it has a 10-channel ADC on it built in, and it can also go into really nice low power modes and just wake up uh, when the other microcontroller wants something for it. So we're just using it for exactly those features. An ADC, it appears like an I2C device on the I2C bus to the ESP8266 and as a serial chip. There are some other potential uses that we didn't really get to this time, but uh, the firmware's there if anybody wanted to add it. We could do, you could use it as a hardware watchdog, so you can forcibly reset the ESP8266 if it goes off script somewhere, which they do sometimes do. Uh, the other interesting one is to use it as a brownout detector voltage monitor, because ESP8266 has a few rough edges. One of them is that it doesn't do brownout detection. It just kind of breaks and starts spewing out random gibberish if the voltage gets too low. Uh, so by having the second microcontroller, you could monitor that. The firmware that's there is in the repository. You've all got it. It uses libraries from the vendor. Uh, they have a thing called STM Cube, which is a set of uh, software libraries in C for dealing with their peripherals. Uh, it's kind of parts of it are false, parts of it are MIT licensed, parts of it are MIT licensed with an extra clause that says you can only use it on their hardware, um, which is something a lot of hardware vendors use. There is a really nice open source library called libopencm3 for STM32s, but the support for this particular chip isn't in there yet, and that was a little bit too much work to, uh, to get that in before this event. The STM cube software is okay. It's very, very heavily abstracted, which when you only have 16K of flash is not great. Um, have to use GCC's link time optimization basically to collapse lots of levels of, of abstraction into something that fits in the code. Everybody who had a board here got it flashed, uh, which meant taking it over to Thomas, who flashed it on uh, via a method called SWD, serial wire debug, uh, which is kind of like JTAG. It's a way of uh, basically debugging or programming a chip. Uh, programming that's probably outside the scope of a quick talk like this, but as I've said before, if you're interested, come and have a chat. 
You can do it with open source tools. You need about ten to twenty dollars worth of hardware. It's not particularly hard to program these ARM cores. Yeah, the STM32 Nucleo is particularly good because you get for twenty bucks you get a whole development board that doubles as a programmer. Uh, everybody, I think, has noticed there's a library called ESP Qui that Mark Wolf wrote to easily get the access, access to the ADC from the ESP. Uh, he likes bad puns, I guess, therefore Qui. Maybe we blame Andy for that, I'm not sure. The other thing I want to talk about quickly is batteries. Everybody got a Trust Fire battery with some fire on the logo. Um, <laughs> I think that's always a sign of a good, a good battery when the flammable battery has fire on it. These are actually supposed to be a pretty good brand of battery, and they're a protected cell. All the same, lithium batteries, really kind of scary. Um, I had a lot of conversations with John about how uncomfortable I was handing out a whole lot of lithium batteries to a bunch of people. So please be careful with them. If you don't think they're that dangerous, go to YouTube and look for lithium battery fires. I guarantee you, you'll be as terrified as me pretty quickly. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of things that lithium batteries don't like. They don't like being charged too much. They don't like being applied too much voltage. They don't like being discharged too much and then charged again. They don't like getting too hot. They don't like physical damage. A lot of those things are taken care of. These batteries are protected cells, so they have protection on the cell against most of these things. The board also has protection in it against a lot of these things. All the same, please don't put a non-protected cell on it. It's good to have two levels of protection. Um, Use the battery case that comes that you got the battery with when you're transporting the battery from places. It should be okay to take it on a plane when it's in that case. Yeah, you can tape the ends if you want to be extra sure. Check your airline rules, but usually taking a ba an external battery in a case is okay. Don't leave it on the PCB with the metal contact sticking out the bottom because that's just tempting fate. Should be fine, but it's the sort of thing that keeps me up at night. You can't go in your checked luggage. Can't go in your checked luggage, that's right. Take it, take it on your carry-on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We couldn't find a way that the metal in there in, from the screwdriver would contact the battery context, but it's probably better to take it out before you put it in. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Good. I've scared everybody. Awesome. I feel okay. Um, another couple little things about the batteries. Uh, this is what a discharge curve from these particular batteries looks like. They were supposed to be 850 milliamp hour, I think. 880 milliamp hour. It's sort of like about 200 milliamp discharge. You can see we sort of get somewhere around the sort of 700 milliamp hour mark, which I think is actually pretty good. Um, the discharge curve on lithium batteries always looks like this. You get a lot off to begin with, then a sort of slow bit, and then a fast bit at the end when it goes. To measure that, as a quick little aside, I used a nifty bit of hardware that I want to plug. It's open source hardware called the Reload Pro. That's my test rig there, just with plugs on the battery and plugged into the Reload Pro. Right. Reload Pro is a programmable load, so you can dial in how many amps of load you want to have, or you can control it over USB to set that, and it'll regulate the, the load as best it can to maintain that. It's made by a company, one person company in the US called Arachnid Labs, who make great open source hardware. For the ES plant purposes, this is the useful part of the curve. Uh, these graphs are also on the wiki, so if you're interested, you can go and have a look there and see what you can expect. You get something like sort of three to 400 milliamp hours of useful discharge out of the battery before the voltage starts to get a little bit low for comfort. Uh, the solar panel that you all have was sold by a Tarbell seller who said that it was a three and a half watt panel. Uh, it was also very cheap, so I took that with a grain of salt. It's about a two watt panel in our tests. Uh, there's my test rig, it's very scientific. I went outside my workshop in Brunswick when it was sunny and I put it in the sun and I used the Reload Pro again. So in this experiment, I'm getting the Reload Pro to ramp up the current that it's drawing out of the, the solar panel. Solar panels all have this uh, behavior like called an IV curve. So there's an open circuit voltage. If you put the solar panel in bright sunshine with absolutely no load connected to it, you'll measure that voltage. And this is a seven volt panel. So that's why we start at 7,000 millivolts on the side. And then as you draw power out of it, there's a curve where the voltage drops off depending on how much uh, current you draw out of it. For the ES plant, it's going to be between probably 200 and 400 milliamps, depending on whether the battery's charging. So that's actually a pretty good curve. We've got lots of voltage at the draw that we care about. Uh, you can also graph the power over it. For our particular purposes, this isn't that useful because of the kind of regulation we're using. But you can see that the sort of peak power, which is that green line, um, sort of peaks just at about the point that the panel 
becomes overloaded and drops off. And there are certain types of charges called MPTT charges, MP, yeah, that will uh, automatically try to maximize that. We don't do that, but the panel is large enough, it doesn't matter. So the ES plant will be powered from one of three places. You plug in USB, you get USB power, and it'll charge the battery. You plug in the solar panel, you'll, and, you get, and you put it in the sunshine, you'll get solar power to the chip, and it'll charge the battery, or it runs off the battery. I had a couple of quick notes here about how we do the power selection, but I'm going to skim over them because I think we're already over time. Um, we could have done something really simple like this with three diodes where current can only flow out of one of them at once. That would have been nice and simple. Um, instead, we sort of did a two-stage thing where there's a FET on the solar input. Like, FET is like a voltage-controlled switch that will turn the solar input off whenever you apply USB power. So the solar power can't be, can't be in the circuit if there's USB voltage present. And then there's a second stage to the circuit where we use an op-amp like a voltage comparator. So basically, this chip can compare the two voltages, which is the battery from the voltage, battery, voltage from the battery, and the voltage from the, um, from the input, which is either USB or solar, and it will switch on one of these two inputs no matter how it works. I did quite a lot of simulating to try to find something here that I didn't think would accidentally backpower the battery uh, for reasons explained before. If you backpower a lithium battery, you might have a bad day, and I didn't want that. Um, and this both didn't backpower in simulation, and it doesn't seem to backpower in real life either, which is nice. Um, I have a couple of measurements. This is just in my house, out of east-facing window that doesn't get a lot of light, but it does get three to four hours of light a day. Um, I ran this measurement on the really, really wet Thursday we had last week, where it was very, very overcast, so that was quite good. You can kind of see the big spikes when the panel was in direct sunlight. The top graph is the, the voltage coming in from the input, so it's either the battery or the solar panel, whatever's higher. Um, and then overnight, you can see there's sort of that just steady decay. And the ESP was in deep sleep, but it was waking up every five minutes, connecting to the Wi-Fi, sending an HTTP message, and going back to sleep. So pretty active most of the time, probably for garden monitoring. You don't care about a five-minute resolution. Uh, for the people with ES plants, there's the code to go into deep sleep. That's on the wiki as well. It's in microseconds for some reason. I don't know why, because it takes 30 seconds to get back on the Wi-Fi after you go to deep sleep. So sleeping for microseconds makes no sense, but, but there you go. There is one unfortunate hardware bug that this has that I just wanted to point out to the people who have it. Um, the output voltage, because of the way the solar panel draws down a voltage as you pull current from it, the circuit actually will sometimes chase the solar panel to the point where they both have almost the same voltage. Um, when it does that, because of the way that the circuit selects one input or the other, it kind of browns out. It uses some power from both, but not all the power. If the battery voltage is high, this isn't a problem, but if the battery voltage drops off a bit, it can become a problem under load. Um, you can see that what's supposed to be 3.3 volts kind of droops down around 3. This doesn't cause stability problems. It's more of a, an ideal situation that hasn't happened. There is a hacky fix that I've found for this, which involves soldering two tiny little resistors on the board. Uh, you can see them under the two FETs here. Basically act as a tiebreaker when the voltages are almost exactly the same, uh, which will probably be in the next revision. Um, it doesn't matter too much if you've got an ES plant now that has the brownout problem, uh, as it doesn't brown out badly enough to cause a real problem. But if you want to get the best possible uh, power performance, you can add these resistors, or you can come and talk to me about adding these resistors, and we'll sort that out. Uh, those are all the aspects I just wanted to go over quickly. So, thanks very much. Do <laughs> you have anything to add? Uh, we got time for questions? Um, sure, let's ask a couple of <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, who's got a question? That was quick, let's go. <laughs> Run. Did you manage to keep the plants alive? <laughs> I'm not sure this project has seen any plants yet. <laughs> the analog input ports that are now currently being used, are they 5 volt resistant? I'm thinking about putting a little voltage divider to actually measure the solar panel on one of the analog inputs. So there's already a channel that, that can do that on, on the board. Um, we didn't explain that very well, but where oh, I've got rid of my slide, but where where I had the graph of over time, the higher number that bounced up and down was the input voltage. It's not strictly the solar panel, but it's whichever is higher out of the solar panel on the battery. 
and that's already using a voltage divided to one of the inputs. Um, you could add another one, definitely. Full scale on the ADC is 3.3 volts. Full uh, power on the solar panel is 7 volts, which is definitely too much. So you'll need a divider anyhow. You should be fine at that, yeah. There are some 5 volt tolerant pins. I think they're those pins, but I'd have to check the data sheet to tell you off the top of my head. But, yeah. but 3.5, you'll probably be okay, especially with very high resistance on the divider, yeah. Okay, it's technically afternoon tea now. Um, maybe one more question before everybody runs out of the room. Nope, okay, looks like we're done. Okay, see you back here in about half an hour for open source car engine management. Thank you.